So, hey, guys, uh, just doing a little demonstration here. We'll get to that in a second, but first off, I'll like introduce ourselves here. This is John. Um, Kevin, we're the design editors here at Wood Magazine, and welcome to uh, Wood Live. Um, if you, uh, a couple housekeeping things, uh, if you uh, enjoy this, push uh, subscribe, too, and um, um, uh, please ask questions. Uh, this show is about you guys interacting, asking questions. We'll try to get to as many of those as possible. John here was uh, actually working on a, uh, a question from last week from a, from, a, from a guy who was asking about the lock miter bit. And um, before I go further pursuing to any live demonstrations, they, they always go real smooth all the time, obviously. Are you okay? <laughs> Anytime a big bit kind of grabs the wood, and it's kind of a scary situation. Oh, I didn't hear a thing. <laughs> Had his headphones on. <laughs> but no, I uh, and and that's what I was thinking about that when I when I ran that because when you run these vertically, so you're running this across vertically, and you end up with basically a knife edge. So I wanted a backer behind that so that I don't get this blowout, which no matter what you do, you're going to get a little bit of it with this bit um, and this wood. So if I just run it through, then I chew up my backer board, and my backer board gets shorter every time, and there's nothing standing behind it. So it's kind of a, I did a split move there where you keep the piece moving. Once you're past the, the bit, you keep the good piece moving. You try to keep that one still. And then you very carefully take it off. But <laughs> I was at a good part in the music, just kind of forgot what was going on. And, um, gotcha. And uh, yeah, so and we're fine. Yeah, good. Everybody's got their fingers, and there's nobody bleeding. So um, yeah, and then the reason why we kind of waited to show this uh, for the next the next show is I was it was a question about it is that um, this bit is notoriously difficult uh, to set up. And um, we have done a few stories in the past uh, on setup, um, and there are, there are different techniques. But I think that it all comes down to um, you know the the right height of the bit and the right position of the fence. So um, John actually uh, not a terribly familiar with this bit, but actually kind of <laughs> I, I had actually printed off an article to kind of go through with this, and I hadn't quite gotten to it. But uh, and I forget what issue this was in, but if you look up. Uh, it's this article here, um, and I, I know that the date on here probably isn't accurate because I think it was done a little further back than 2014. But I printed this off of off of off our website, uh, the Wood Store. Um, it's a way of, of setting up this bit, and it, it is proven. Um, John kind of about went about a little bit slightly different way, but the same principle. Yeah, Kevin gave me this article, and um, I took. I looked at it a little bit. It's a lot of words, so I just ignored the words <laughs> and uh, looked at a couple photos and went, okay, now I'll do what I want to do. Um, <laughs> and uh, I will tell you, uh, if you want to try to do this, it's worth getting a good bit and it's worth getting a new bit. The first one I tried okay. was this bit, and uh, sorry, Bob, your bits wore out. Um, so this bit, this bit has been around for a little while. It's been used. And you could really tell feeding it, you really had to push hard to get it to go through. And the finish quality uh, on these wasn't the best either. Um, the other thing is that it has a little bit of wear. So even when I get this together, these two points are locking before the miters come together. So you have a little bit of a, um, well, you're, you're just not going to get this thing to pull tight, no matter how much clamping pressure you put on there. Um, put a new one in, which was happened to be a much larger bit, which is always more fun. And with that one, you can get a lot tighter joints. So the, these are the individual pieces, and you know when you put them together, you could almost see that joint disappear. So within this joint, you basically have two miters. You have a miter on the outside edge, on the inside edge, and then on the inside, you have a, a series of locking fingers that hold that together. So this would be a great way if you had a big case piece and you wanted to uh, to really have a, a nice tight miter and hold it together, this would be a, a great way to go about it. Like you said, fussy to set up, though. Yeah. Really fussy to set up. So you, uh, you had a little tip you were going to share? This is my schematic. Okay, how in the world to set this bit up? So this, what I've drawn out on paper, this would be this joint right here. And the center line of this joint, uh, 
Uh, so the center line of the board and the center line of this joint actually intersects right in the middle of this angled bevel. So you have about 3 sixteenths of an inch up here, 3 sixteenths down here. This is about an eighth, this is about an eighth. And then within that line, that's where you have to hit your midline. So the first thing I did on when I set it up, you can see it on these pieces. Uh, I don't know if, can you see the, the pencil line? So I have a center line down the center of this, and then I actually have a center line that goes across right here where it hits that bevel. And if you can get that center line to match up, you got a nice tight joint. Uh, one tip I do have on this is on the exit side, I've tried backing it up with a lot of different things. You always have a little bit of chip out. So if you can run these boards a little wide. So for instance, these are like four and a quarter. I'd take these over the table saw, rip an eighth off each side, and then you get a nice little tight box like this without a lot of, of chip out. So initially, and that article kind of agrees with this, when setting it up, the first thing you want to do is deal with bit height, just up and down. And then once you get your bit height dialed in, then you can work on setting your fence. So, but that's what I found, because the first thing I did was I tried to hit the center line there, tried to hit the center line there, just dead wrong. Once I figured out it was right down the middle, then you were in good shape. So. Yeah. yeah, we got a couple people chiming in here. Uh, um, you know, one, kind of like what you were talking about, one, uh, Gerald, uh, Gerald Hayes actually suggested cutting out a one big wide board and then splitting it, so then you have actually yeah, good, a good idea. Uh, always leaving yourself a little extra, like you said, to kind of get rid of some of that chip out is, is a good idea. Um, the uh, taller fence support will help you with that uh, piece kind of moving maybe, too. That's a good idea. Hopefully. Yep. Um, and then I had a question from Roy Rodriguez. Um, it is, it, is it always a full cut, or do you normally make a second finish cut? And I think John was doing a full cut here just because we, we, we didn't want to sit here for the rest of the show and watch him do uh, one box. But uh, in our article we did initially, what we had done is actually put a secondary fence on the fence a quarter inch. So basically you're just moving the bit out a little bit, so you're taking a little lighter pass. Then you remove that secondary fence, the quarter inch piece, yeah. and then you make your final pass. And it's a, it's a great way, safe, safe way, because you're not trying to hog off that much material. And those bits, are those, some of those bits, are, bit. those are big. But the, the thing about the big bit, you can take a full pass because it just has enough mass to go through it. You yeah. just have to kind of hold on. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's kind of like a, almost like a shaper, shaper bit. Yeah. Big bit. So. It's, so. A, it's a second date router bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, another comment in here about, um, and I'm not going to bad mouth lock miter bits. I'll be honest with you, they're hard to set up, and I, and I struggle with it, too. One, one guy in here suggested doing a spline miter. I, I actually love a spline miter <laughs> uh, because, you know, I'm, I feel comfortable cutting miters. A spline miter is a very strong joint, gives you a lot of glue surface, and it can be kind of decorative, too, so uh, especially if you use an alternate uh, species of wood. Um, so, um, you got anything else on that? You wore yourself out. Well, I'm ready to go home. Right? Okay. <laughs> well, we got a few more questions here. Um, the uh, what's the benefit of a this over a dovetail? Um, and I, as far as you know, a corner of a box, I, I don't think there's a benefit to this. It's just another another corner joint. Say if you're dovetailing a box and you want to show the, those joints, um, it's just it's no. I don't think it's a benefit. I just think it's. It's a different way of looking at it. And it's a nice, clean way to finish a box. I mean, you have that nice mitered corner. Yep. Uh, you, you do have more than just a miter in there. You, you have that little bit of a finger joint. And uh, once you have this set up, you can make a lot fast. So you could do a whole set of drawers with this. Yeah. Um, you know, I think we had a suggestion here. If you could leave it set up, if you do a lot of this, that's, that's a great idea if you've got multiple router tables but um, <laughs> after you set it up I think you'll go buy a new router table yeah. and just leave it well or as you said you too you know we can you could um, I think leaving a couple pieces that you you know you've had this sample you've cut um, you can get back to that a lot faster by just having your 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 sample box ready to go um, I wanted to just kind of briefly um, touch on a, on a new project we've got coming down the road. Uh, John and I are usually always kind of working on something in the shop. Um, and this this is in, coming up in, I, 
Honestly, I think it's probably two or three issues down the road. This is two, this a 242? 242. So it's probably what are we talking, September, several October? months out, probably this fall. Um, but I just kind of wanted to show you guys this project. We're just about wrap, wrapping up with it. But um, this is a uh, cherry uh, kind of dresser, if you will, kind of the chest on chest. So it's got um, a series of drawers. Um, and then I don't have the back on this yet, but... Uh, one of the things I was thinking about with this um, is that this could be used for, there's a shelf that goes in here, you can use it for sweaters or what have you, or you don't have to do the shelf, and this will fit, and I forget whether, I forget what the size of TV, how big a TV, but it'll, it's a 32, it may even, may even be a 36 inch TV, but it will definitely fit a flat screen really nicely if you want to use this kind of at the foot of your bed. Um, and then um, with this piece, um, we did do the, the machine cut dovetails, just uh, with the 7 8 inch spacing um, on the drawers, so the kind of a traditional uh, type drawer construction. And then uh, something else we did in this article, and we've done this before, but we did kind of get into a technique on basically making your own kind of uh, crown molding. So um, that's just something you've always been kind of curious about. We've done it before, but this may be a little different spin. So. Um, and then I don't have it in there if you guys are wondering what's going on with this. Basically, I wanted to kind of incorporate a little accent tile. So that's what that space is for. So we'll kind of glue that, glue that in. Something you can either do or not do, but just an accent piece. Something different. So that's coming up um, 242. So September, October time frame. Um, let's see what else we got here. Um... We've got guys still talking about that lock miter. Um, let's see. Yep, we can use the piece every single time. Uh, use that as your setup. Um, <laughs> let's see here. Kevin, there's a question from uh, Brett. He wants to know if you guys use the gripper, uh, the push block, uh, in the shop, and if so, what do you think of it? Um, I used. I don't use it a lot. Uh, it, I do think it's a it's a good tool. Um, I know. Uh, Bob, our tools editor, uses that quite a bit. Uh, he's sitting next to my saw, and when I know Bob's been in the shop, the gripper is always on top of the saw. I leave it in there for him. Um, he feels comfortable with that. Um, my only, my, I like the gripper. My only downside with the gripper, personally, is that I like to see the blade at all times. Uh, it makes me nervous to have that gripper thing go over the blade and I don't see where, I know where it is, but I can't see it. So to me, I like to have a push stick that's out, you know, the blade's exposed, my hand's clear away from it, but I can still see where that blade is. Uh, just a personal uh, preference. Yeah, uh, push sticks are a personal preference because even between us, we don't like the same push sticks. So yeah, grab, everyone's kind of unique. And, uh, it's right there on the edge of the, yeah. No, the push stick. The, the, no. Yeah. Um, Kevin's is very advanced. Yeah, very very advanced. Uh, <laughs> this is a piece of quarter inch ply. You can make out anything, but you know, basically, if I'm ripping thin stock, still, you know, it's I, I can keep my hand, I can keep pressure down, you know, on my on my wood, my hands away from the blade. Um, I've got a nice long shoe uh, to create down pressure so this is my personal preference you know and this is this has been um, been my go-to for a long time um, this is one I like um, I really like it because Kevin doesn't like it so I know he'll never use it so then over at my saw I keep this for when he comes over so I know yeah. when you've been using my saw yeah. because this guy's out and uh, I, I just like these I, I have one on all the saws I use and um, I don't know what it is. It's um, just the geometry of it. This is made by Craig, and uh, it actually has a built-in rule that I never use unless I'm without my regular rule. But um, for some people, they'll really like that. You can use it as a height gauge to set up. But uh, yeah, this this one I really like. So um, everyone has their own personal preference. It's it's uh, what feels good in your hand. What feels good in use. Yeah, and I think I think for different machines, and we were kind of talking specifically about the table saw, but you know you certainly see these uh, uh, kind of a D handle pads that you can be using on uh, the what John was using earlier on the router table, 
or um, those will work really well for the joiner. Um, obviously, uh, probably a much better than something like this. So, um, well, yeah. and those D handles, you'll see it on uh, different push things as well. The the ones we have, the the padding is really really soft, so it really grabs and really pushes. Uh, well, you 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 just feel like you're in control of the workpiece. Um, the smaller, cheaper ones, um, sometimes it, you'll you'll feel it's almost like a stiff, hard pad, and it doesn't grab anything unless it's rough sawn. So, even those push pads aren't all created equal. Yeah, that uh, I, I've I, yeah. So it's um, personal preference, I guess. Plan yeah. those. So um, just. Uh, Keep the questions coming, guys. If you got questions, we're we're, we're open to anything, almost. Um, I got a question from Bob here. Can you round over the outside edge? If so, how much? Uh, can you round over the outside edge? If so, how much? What are we talking about on that? I Probably guess. the lock miter. Lock miter. Oh, I guess that's a good point. At least that's what he's talking about. So on this, um, excuse my pointer. You have about three sixteenths of an inch on either side. So I would say you could, you could even come back with almost a half inch or three quarter inch round over before you get into end grain here. So you can actually round this over quite a bit. And if your joint's nice and tight, uh, that's one of the benefits on this. If that miter's nice and tight, you can uh, you can chamfer it, you can round over it, you could even put a decorative profile on it and probably get away with it. <coughs> the only negative thing is once you do that, you start exposing end grain. So it's might look a little different, but if uh, if you're running this on uh, edge grain, then uh, I don't think it'll matter at all. So this would be another way, like to build up a leg. So uh, instead of running it this way, we'd run the boards straight up and down, and you can build up a, a tube to make a leg. You know, and that's one thing I was going to talk to sit, mention. That one thing I ha I've seen this done. I have not done it, but I've seen guys build these boxes where they do that joint on the top and the side edges of these. Oh yeah. So it's you can't see the joints. So it's one mitered box. So, so that talk about your setup needs to be on. That is, uh, but it's a cool box. You don't even know the lock miter exists until you actually cut the box wow. open. You should go try that right now. No, I'm going to pass on that. I got. We got lots of questions. We got to answer here first. <laughs> um, I got a question from Matt Sandy, um, and this is a good question for um, uh, talking about smaller shops. Any advice on uh, mobile? mobile table saw bases and that sort of thing uh, that's that are sturdy um, there are there are good brands of mobile bases and then there's there's okay brands of mobile bases um, and I, I'm not going to pick on anybody but I, I would look for stuff that the metal is heavy duty um, they um, I have had luck with the ones where you just buy the metal base and you provide kind of the wood that goes in the middle. Um, I think the key to a table saw and probably any tool is trying to keep your center of gravity as low as possible on those bases. I mean, the higher your your unit is off the ground, I think the more unstable it's going to be. So um, there are some good brands out there. Um, I guess anything to add on that? <laughs> no, I, I, I mean. My, my plug is, um, you know, we, we have saw stops in the shop because um, our employer wants us to be safe, and um, the uh, mobile base I have on mine is really nice. I, I really like that base. Um, but we, I like the Delta downstairs, too. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think if you can find a saw, you know, uh, that uh, has the ability to, that's that, and that base down there, is that part of that? It's not, it was an add-on, was, add was that not? Add on, but that base, which was really cool about that, is that it can quickly be moved into a mobile position and then released back down almost on itself to the floor. So, giving you that stability. Um, I mean, if you're in a committed to a mobile shop, I think it's important that you know buy, you know, upgrade, buy the higher end, nicer models of, of that because it's obviously something you want to use over a longer period of time. I would. Get the, get the higher end stuff. Yeah, and, and where your shop space is limited, a lot of people fall into the trap of just parking the table saw. And, you know, in a build, you might not use it for more than a, just a few minutes, but uh, you, it's just in the way the rest of the time, and you yeah. just pile stuff on there. I know I keep my saw clean at all times. Right. But well, I keep my, my saw in the garage <laughs> where it should be. Yeah. 
Cars are outside. Shop's inside. Isn't your car inside now? No, it's not. Oh. Um, Is Rose going to check in on that one, too? <laughs> no. No, we're not going down that road. Um, let's see. <laughs> Um, okay, so any advice on using India ink for staining wood? It'll stain it. It will, it will definitely stain it. I guess if you're looking for black, um, that will get you there. Um, just uh, make sure you wear some old clothes, old clothes and some um, um, latex gloves because it, it, will, it will eventually find its way on something other than you. Um, and it would, it's permanent. Well, and that's one of the better things to put on any color wood to get it jet black because we did it on that, that green and green table yeah. where I was trying to make those maple plugs and trying to ebonize them and I had to dye them and stain them and sharpie them and do everything to, to get yeah, and that, and that's And that's typically when you're going to be using that, I guess, is you're probably not staining a whole piece, but it's an accent piece, usually like a, a, the plugs or an inlay with like the green and green kind of style uh, furniture. So, But it does work very effectively. Um, I typically try not to use it. I try to have a container of it that I can actually dip the piece I want to in it, and I'm not having to brush it on or whatever sort of thing. Gloves. Wear gloves. Yeah, always wear gloves. Um, and unless you want to show off what you've been doing this weekend is playing with India ink, I guess, <laughs> then don't wear gloves. But um, Oh, here's a good question for you. Any question, any tips on jointing without a joiner? Yeah. Well, you've got your method. <laughs> you got your method. I have a method too. So you go ahead. Are you are you going to go with table saw? or Are you going to go with hand plane? I was going to go with table saw, because I'm. <laughs> I well, don't want to be ridiculed when I get out my hand plane. The first thing <laughs> I'd say, I, I've I've done a, a lot of joining with a, a circ saw and a, a straight edge, yep. uh, especially if you have a track saw. We don't have a track saw out, but um, if you have flat boards, you can very quickly get a straight edge with a yeah. track saw. My next would be using a hand plane, um, and I'll leave the table saw. Well, here. I mean, it's, the table saw is going to be similar to the track saw in, in essence, but you're, we've created, and we've done these in the magazine before too, where we'll actually create a sled, a uh, piece of plywood that you, you know, you buy off the rack, and it's a fairly known entity that that's a straight line. You're using that to register against your fence on your table saw, uh, and you have some way of either clamping that board down or screwing it down in a piece part that's going to be the waste, and then you can rip that edge off. A great way of joining, obviously that blade is going to be, to quality of cut is going to make a big difference on that. So, um, you know, you don't have to have, uh, you know, an 80 tooth blade or anything like that, or um, it does need to be sharp uh, because that will give you a better glue surface. But that's a great way yeah. of joining, and, and maybe if you feel comfortable with a joiner plane, once you get that straight edge, you're making maybe one or two passes to kind of clean that mm -hmm. curb up before you mess up that. Yeah, I'd say if you're going after it with a hand plane, divide and conquer. The first thing, just get it straight, then worry about getting it square to the edge. And another option that you'd have would be a straight edge with a router. Just a router with a straight bit will give you a really nice uh, straight edge as long as you're, what you're using to guide it is halfway straight. Router table with an offset fence on the outside. That'll work too, but we can't use our router table anymore because it has the lock planter bit in it, <laughs> and it's never coming out. <coughs> we well, need a new router table. Yeah, I'm. I'm wanting. Uh, I want Jim Seagraves to stop by because he actually said he did one of those boxes where he did the lids, and yeah, uh, I want to. I want to see that happen. <laughs> yeah, send pictures, Jim. Uh, we're interested in seeing that. That's 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 pretty cool. Um, um so that was uh, oh, oh, Joiner wood filler. Uh, wood filler. Uh, box. Are there any other junk miter? Are there any junk miter box bits? Um, okay, so Roy wants details. On, <laughs> you know, he wants us to name brands. I guess what brand did you use? Um, that thing's a Bosch. So, I, I you know, I, I have not used these bits a, a lot. So, um, I would, I would tend to go towards a brand of router bit that you more more familiar with. And I'm talking about bits that probably you see advertised in our magazine because these are geared more towards the higher end, intermediate woodworker. Um, so the, they're not somebody that someone's going to use this one time and throw it away. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you're going to go to the home center and try to find one of these things, 
Um, in my experience, I found some good stuff there, but I've all found some stuff that I pretty much bought it for that one use, and that was it. So it's one of those things where, yeah, if you're going to invest the money, and I think these things run 35 40 bucks, Bob, in that price range. 60 bucks to, okay. Because I saw one that $100. Okay, so Bob <laughs> oh. sold. Yeah, Bob's selling me 100 bucks. You know, okay, so that, so, so is this 100 bucks? No. So why'd you give us this one to work with? <laughs> Uh huh. So yeah, well, and even this yeah. One, Bob comes out, hands us this one, but it's yeah. Yeah. So even um, this one in its day, probably the you know when it was brand new worked fine. But you know, like anything, after you use it a while, it probably needs a good resharpening, which is probably why he gave it to us so we'd resharpen it for him. And okay, I got a good question about. Um, Billing, filling voids in large slabs, and that, this is from Ted. I don't uh, demurs. Yeah, um, actually, Kevin if you, and John, if you, uh, the, he actually says, are there any special tricks to mixing epoxy and turquoise to fill those voids? Um, I don't know about the turquoise. I don't know about turquoise either. I'll, I'll be honest, I've never used it. But I've used a lot of epoxy, and I, I use um, uh, System 3. Uh, typically, when I'm using larger volumes, um, because it, you can get it in larger volumes. I know there's other brands out there. Um, I've tried not to try to fill big voids all at one, all at one time, um, because it. And then the, maybe there's our, there are tricks. Uh, I mean, you can certainly consult a lot of these epoxy companies that you buy the epoxy from. The bigger, bigger boys, they have 1-800 numbers you can call, and maybe they can help you a little bit too. But I have found that mixing smaller amounts tends to help eliminate some of the the bubbles. Yeah, the uh, because the if you voids. that you get that epoxy down in there and you get a thick layer, uh, you've probably noticed this that it creates a tremendous amount of heat. I don't know if you've ever anybody's out there mixed up a lot of epoxy stuck in a cup. You come back to grab that cup and it's like ooh, it's like a hot stove. I mean, it's putting off a lot of energy, and so it's down in there. It's kind of cooking. So you're going to get those bubbles coming up. Uh, so I just think less is probably a better way to go. Uh, with the, you know, mixing in something else, I, I don't know. Um, again, about, I've done it with, you know, with a uh, powdered dye before. Yeah, or throwing some sawdust. It's, it's just a matter with the turquoise of getting the right mixture. So you're not too lean and you're not too heavy. Yeah. I would, I would definitely consult. Um, consult those guys uh, with their helplines because they, they know their product better than anybody. Um, um, the other thing is um, with big slabs, sometimes it's kind of cool just to leave, leave the voids there. Um, you know, um, if it's not in a situation where you're going to have a lot of food, um, you know, falling down in the cracks, not a dining room table. Um, I know I have, a, I have a big slab for a coffee table. My kids love sticking Lego block guys down in the hole. So it's, you know, <laughs> It can be, it, it, yeah, whatever you want. Um, okay, got uh, George Von Driska. He just chimed in on that. Lock, Bosch, Lauder, Bosch Lockmiter bit is $96 on uh, Google. So, um, or he Googled that. So, thanks, thanks George, because we weren't sure we could trust Bob. <laughs> His prices are too high. Too, too high. Too high. Hey. Um, <laughs> Why do you think the radial arm saw, I'm assuming RAS means radial arm saw. Uh, Bob wants to know why do you think the RAS went away like the dinosaurs? Uh, I see more people in projects that make jigs for table saws to make it perform tasks, and they were designed to do so. Um, I, I think, um, I'm not going to read all that, but I, I kind of, I, there's, the, the reason why, that, I mean, Lucas, you're going to spin around uh, real quick. Um, to answer your question, Bob, the, the radial arm saw didn't go away, um, but I think a lot of guys that still have them use them more for one one purpose. Um, and I think a couple reasons. I think one is safety um, has a big a big play on this. And I don't you know want to get into I'm not a legal mind, and I don't know I'm not I, I've had a, I've. I grew up in a shop where that was the first big power saw that I was allowed to use, and trust me, it would took me a long time to have the guts to use that to rip a board. Um, it's just 
you know, it's great for cut, cutting material down, uh, cross-cutting, but ripping. Well, yeah. And there are still some really good radial arm saws being made today. Um, I, I think um, part, part of the problem, too, is you, you have people with really good radial arm saws that can do whatever they want. And then maybe someone that would buy a budget brand radial arm saw would try the same thing and find, okay, I just went from cross cut to rip, and now all my, uh, you know, uh, I'm not cutting straight, I'm not doing yeah. this. And then they go, well, I'm just going to set it up like my lock miter bit. Leave yeah. it alone. And, I, and I think, yeah, Bob's going to, I don't Bob to chime in here, but to, the, the radial arm saw does have a lot of benefits to it. It's just, it's, it's a method of work. So um, personal preference, too. Over to Bob. Over to Bob. Yeah, one of the other factors in this, Kevin, is the the advent of the sliding uh, miter saw. That that has really replaced a lot of the the radial arm saws in shops, and it's become, it's you get almost nearly the same capacity. It's a lot safer tool, a lot more affordable, more portable, smaller package. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that, and they're they're just readily plentiful at all kinds of stores. So the the slider has really just supplanted the the radial yeah. arm saw in a lot of cases. Yeah, uh, the one thing a radial arm saw, and I don't like again. Uh, we have one here. I do. I'm a table saw guy because that's what tend to I tend to do more work there. But you know, a radial arm saw, a guy can set that up with a dado head and set up you know a cabinet side. He can dado that. You can't you do that can on see what you can't dado. do that on a sliding miter, and you can't and you can see what you're doing, which you can on a table saw. Yeah. Um, I just, to me, ripping on that was, I, I like to be a little more in control. What else you got? Dave's, Dave's saying that you're crazy, I think, so. Um, Gotta wrap it up. Yeah, so if, uh, there's, we're going to kind of dig back through this, and if there's some um, additional questions in here, we'll, we'll obviously try to get to them uh, maybe the next episode. I um, appreciate you guys signing in and, and interacting, and um, feel, feel free to send questions on uh, maybe for the next time we get, get, get together. So, um, yeah, and if you like it, subscribe. Definitely. Yep. And, and if you want us to keep doing this, we'll keep doing it. Yeah, yeah. So thanks for joining, and we'll see you next time.